Welcome to Focus on Seniors, a television show sponsored by Helping Seniors of Brevard County, Florida. The show is designed to make you aware of senior issues, needs, and resources available to help us age in place and with dignity. This show will help you as you develop your own aging and care plan. I'm Joe Steckler and welcome to Focus on Seniors, the television arm of Helping Seniors of Brevard County, a show designed to provide you with information on how to develop your own aging plan and care plan. Our topic today is cardiovascular disease prevention and treatment. And with me in the studio is Dr. Hong Zhang, Brevard Heart and Vascular Institute. Welcome, Dr. Zhang. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's a... Uh, it's a pleasure, folks, for me to have Dr. Zhang on the uh, on the program because uh, Dr. Zhang has been somewhat involved in my own treatment for uh, pain management, and uh, um, I've been undergoing um, pain management interventions for about three years because of a a problem in my back that has uh, tr uh, worked over into my hip area and. They've not really figured out what it is. And uh, Dr. Zhang, you checked me to see if I had clots and some other things, and you you felt I was in pretty good shape. You checked that okay from my standpoint. <laughs> well, today our specialty is heart disease. Um, that's something I'm also aware of. Um, perhaps you could just state for our um, our viewers, uh, I, you are you're, you were born in South Korea, but it's, it's interesting to me that you've traveled all over the world, but your, where was your education primarily obtained? Uh, my medical education was obtained at the uh, University of South Florida in Tampa. And after that, I've gone through residencies, internship, and fellowships up, up in uh, Virginia, Richmond, Virginia. In Richmond? Yes. And that's where my granddaughter is, is under, she's going through a uh, training program now at the University of Richmond to be a... Uh, uh, hospital administrator. Oh, fantastic. So maybe we, we can look at diplomas someday, and her name will, might be on a similar diploma as yours. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about your specialty. And my first question is, how prevalent is heart disease today? Heart disease is quite prevalent uh, today. Uh, we have made a lot of improvements uh, during the past couple of decades in reducing cardiac death. Uh, in fact, compared to 20 years ago, uh, we have a roughly 30% reduction in cardiovascular death today, mostly due to improvement in terms of medication, but also awareness, as well as uh, uh, risk factor modifications and different procedures that we have now. But on the flip side, heart disease is still number one killer uh, in the United States, responsible for roughly 40% of all cardiac death, uh, all, all death combined. Um, we have roughly 5 million Americans uh, who has been diagnosed with heart disease, and each year roughly 1.5 million uh, Americans have a heart attack. Uh, that's roughly uh, one heart attack each 25 seconds. So we still have a long way to go in terms of reducing cardiac, uh, uh, you know, preventing heart attacks or heart disease. How, if, um In comparing the numbers of people with heart disease in the United States as compared to uh, Asia or the Mediterranean, is there a significant or marked difference in, in any of the countries in comparison to the United States? There may be a little difference between country to country depending on the dietary uh, uh, differences and uh, risk factor differences. But overall, globally, heart disease still ranks as number one killer, uh, heart disease and stroke. Uh, are considered number one killer um, worldwide. worldwide. Yes, that's an interesting. Uh, that's an interesting uh, comment. That's something that, uh, in all my research for all the shows I do, I I never really thought about that. I know I, I had um, while I was getting ready to do one of my radio shows, I experienced a pain in my upper left back, and what I had was a dissecting, ascending, and descending aorta that mm -hmm. went all the way down into my stomach. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I never will forget, I, uh, I, uh, I was on a gurney in Wustoff Hospital, and my uh, cardiologist came in and said, what are you doing here? And I said, um, I think you better find out, Gene. And uh, 
I just had a checkup with him last week, and he said, you know, it was almost eight years ago to the date that I saw you, and you were having that problem, and we got you over to Orlando, and uh, I was in surgery for 12 hours, and uh, I walked out of it, which, which points out to me, Dr. Zhang, the need for more people to be aware of specialists and, and, and doctors like you that, that, that deal with problems with the heart. Right. People are, I, I, do you find people are afraid to come to you and say, what's my heart like, doc? <laughs> A lot of times, uh, heart disease, uh, the focus on the heart disease uh, is missing because you may not necessarily have symptoms. Uh, um, of a heart disease until you're having a heart attack or having a major catastrophic event. Uh, but it's important that it is uh, something that can rear at, at any point. Uh, so keeping a vigilant uh, um, uh, control of your risk factors uh, and keeping a keen eye of your symptoms are, are very important. What are some of the risk factors? That's an important, that's a, that's a, that's a very important word. In fact, I think I even had that down. <laughs> Sign, mm -hmm. What I call it was signs and symptoms, but is that the same thing as a risk factor? That's uh, well, the signs and symptoms are the symptoms that the patient's experiencing. Risk factors are, are factors that can contribute or increase the prevalence or risk of having a heart attack or heart disease. So well, let's the, talk about that first. Sure. The signs and symptoms of a heart disease uh, could be... Uh, Various depending on person to person, but mostly patients describe dull, heavy pressure sensation in the chest. The pressure sensation may radiate up to the shoulder or to the arm, or it may radiate up to the jaws as well too. Uh, a lot of times the uh, symptoms are associated with shortness of breath, nausea, uh, breaking out into cold sweats sometimes can happen. Sometimes patients may have chest palpitation, feeling weak or dizzy. Uh, and those are some of the common signs and symptoms of a uh, heart attack. Um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of people are not aware of the signs and symptoms of heart disease because if you look at some of the recent data, only one patient out of five patients actually presents to the hospital within one hour of onset of a heart attack. And that's uh, a lot of times attributed to not being aware of the signs, uh, the symptoms that they're having. And, equating that to an actual heart attack. A lot of times uh, patients are under the impression that they might be having indigestion or they might be having arthritic problems and they try to self-medicate or self-treat uh, their symptoms and that puts a delay in presenting to the uh, hospital and that ultimately uh, pays out in, in a form of negative outcome for these patients. I have heard it said that women and men experience different warning signs. Am I correct? The symptoms may differ from patient to patient, but also from age, uh, different age group may experience different type of symptoms. Women may have a, a, a very different set of symptoms compared to men. Uh, typically, the middle-aged uh, uh, male may have chest pressure, heavy sensation, as if somebody's sitting on their chest, associated with nausea, associated with diffuse sweats, um, uh, women may present with similar symptoms, but they may also have sharp jabbing type of pain. Uh, so the character of the pain uh, may be different. Or they may not have any chest pain symptoms, but instead have shortness of breath or nausea. Uh, so symptoms are sometimes different from patient to patient, uh, from different uh, sex of the patient as well, too. Also consider that people who have conditions like diabetes may have silent heart, heart attack. Or yeah, what kind? Silent heart attack. Oh, so I, I've heard where, that before. Where yeah. they do not have any uh, chest pain symptoms uh, and uh, later told that you had a heart attack and had a significant heart muscle damage after the fact. In the case of a diabetic? Mm, that can happen. Um, I've had several diabetics who presented to the hospital with just complaints of shortness of breath and nausea. Uh, and in fact, their EKG is clearly showing a massive heart attack. So. So the key is to sort of be vigilant about your symptoms and if there's any suspicion that this might be a, a heart attack, that present yourself to the emergency department uh, so that appropriate treatment uh, can take place and that there isn't a delay in getting those uh, appropriate treatment. If a person has a massive heart attack, right. have people been known to recover from massive heart attacks? They. The total, uh, the prognosis of a heart attack um, 
depends on various different factors, but the, one of the most important factors would be time. 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 So if you had a heart attack right now and you present to the hospital within an hour, and um, they appropriately diagnose you with a heart attack and get you to a cardiac cath lab and get that block vessel opened up, uh, your prognosis actually is quite good. However, if you are having a heart attack and there has been three, four, five hours delay in getting to the hospital, and you end up with subsequent uh, significant heart muscle damage, that heart muscle damage, uh, it, it's going to spell poor prognosis in terms of heart failure that can ensue, uh, or heart rhythm problem that can ensue as well too. So your prognosis really is, uh, time is really an important factor in, um, in how you will come out of a heart attack. I, um, I myself uh, had a hiatal hernia. Mm -hmm. And um, I was a young officer at the time and under a lot of stress and um, Several times in the night, uh, I was in the, at the war college, and I thought I was having a heart attack. Mm. And I went to the hospital several times, and one of the other officers took me. And um, turned out it was just a high edel hernia, but the symptoms were very close to what a heart attack was. Right. So I, I, I guess the, um, the moral of the story is that if you think you're having a problem, get yourself to the hospital That's emergency exactly room right. as fast as you can. That's exactly right. But also, part of that equation is when and when not to, when to take yourself or when to call 911. Well, in terms of heart, um, it's always wise to call 911 for several reasons. Number one, if, um, if you take yourself to the emergency department while having a heart attack, there's a quite possibility that you might hurt yourself or others on the road. Um, through motor vehicle accidents. Um, if you ask your family members uh, to take you to the ER, and if you're truly having a heart attack, um, if you are going to a toxic heart rhythm problem, or if your heart stops during transit, your family members or your friends may not be able to help you. Um, so it's wise to call 911 and have the EMS take you to the ER. The other perks of uh, having EMS uh, be involved is the fact that they are in constant contact with the emergency department doctors. So the paramedics are. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're truly having a heart attack, they can give the heads up to the uh, ER physician who can actually call in a cardiac cath lab, especially during off hours uh, in the middle of the night, so, uh, and to a point where there is not much of a delay in getting you to the cardiac cath table. There are several instances where we get called into a hospital for a heart attack that's coming in and we are there even before the patients uh, made it to the hospital. So that they really, as soon as the patient hits the uh, ER door, we are right there. We can assess the patient quickly, take him to the cardiac cath lab, get that blood vessel opened up. Again, time is critical uh, when it comes to heart attacks. I, um, I understand that. I, for, for a couple of years, I, would have a, I was having a problem where I just felt my heart thump. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 didn't, I didn't know what it was. I talked to the doctor about it. And, of course, when they checked me out, he didn't see anything wrong. Well, this happened one day when I was in my office. And the people in my, at my organization called 911. They came. And the paramedics checked me. And they said, hey, we don't see anything wrong now. But they had me all hooked up to the equipment. They said, we're going to take you up to Woodstock to check you out. Right. I said, fine. In the, uh, on the way to Woodstock, my heart did this weird thing, and I saw the paramedic instantly react. And what was happening, my heart was dropping to about a 30 beat a minute. Mm -hmm. I'd have a pacemaker. They wouldn't let me out of Wustoff <laughs> on had a Friday. Pacemaker. They, they kept me there till the doctor put the pacemaker in the following Monday. But I think that um, when we're talking about cardiovascular disease, um, we point out the need for regular medical care by a, by a heart doctor. Um, I think that, uh, I think many people don't, don't look at the importance of having a cardiologist until they have a problem. That's exactly right. Is that, that brings us to the question, who really should be considered for screening for heart disease? Um, my opinion is that if anybody is having symptoms 
of cardiac symptoms, chest pain, shortness of breath, especially associated with physical activity or exertion, they really need to go see the doctor. Okay? But if, even if you don't have any cardiac symptoms, if you have multiple coronary artery disease risk factors, such as high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, uh, family history, strong family history of heart disease, uh, history of tobacco use, those are some of the risk factors for heart disease. If you have those, you really go, should be seen by your uh, uh, provider and discuss your overall risk and need for additional screening tests if need, uh, if need to be performed. It's been your experience that people tend to uh, try to shield themselves from uh, problems that they don't want to know about? A lot of people are in denial, especially when it comes to something as serious as heart disease. And uh, um, yeah, a lot of times patients will tell you that, uh, that uh, they have quit smoking. Uh, in reality, they are still smoking when you talk to the wife. So, so there are things that they try to, uh, um, maybe they are ashamed into uh, uh, not disclosing all the information. But it's important to disclose uh, everything about your health uh, to your uh, provider so that they can actually give you, make, uh, give you an accurate assessment of your risk. Where do you find the most people at risk? Well, in terms of when it comes to coronary artery disease, um, there's a lot of different risks involved, and not just one thing. Uh, dietary is definitely one of the most important risk factors, along with the, uh, uh, your cholesterol levels. Um, you know, having the good amount of uh, good cholesterol level and low amount of bad cholesterol level. Yeah, uh, along with the triglyceride levels and whatnot. Uh, so dietary uh, intake is one of the risk factors among many other uh, risk factors for heart disease. Obesity is also a significant risk factor for heart disease as well as good control of your diabetes, your high blood pressure, your cholesterol, and as well as uh, quitting smoking. Uh, that is also a huge, a big risk factor that uh, really should be uh, uh, controlled. When you get into the subject of obesity, um, as a layperson, I look at the overweight problems of the heart trying to pump um, in a manner it shouldn't have to pump or being overworked to compensate for the movement of the effort it takes to move that person. But at the same time, I think of all the stuff that the person has put into their body in order to get to that obese problem that not only does it cause them the weight problem, but it right. causes them the nutritional part of the problem. Right. And how in the world do we convince our people in, our, in the United States of America that we would be smarter from just the viewpoint of vascular disease, that uh, if we ate smarter, we'd be a heck of a lot better off? Well, that's going <laughs> to take a lot of education, I believe. Uh, because uh, when you look at the obesity rate uh, from 1970s to current date, 2012, uh, we have roughly 30% uh, obesity rate uh, now, as opposed to 15% in the 1970s. When you look at obesity with uh, overweight, uh, you know, people who are considered to be overweight, we're looking at roughly 65% uh, of the population being either overweight or obese. So it is an epidemic uh, that uh, spreading across the United States at this point. It's going to take a lot of education. It's going to uh, require a lot of uh, social programs to get the uh, people out there and exercising and eating proper diets. I'm very much aware of what you just said, but I, I think that we have a mindset, Dr. Zhang, in our country that says, you don't talk about another's appearance. You don't talk about a woman being overweight. Right. Um, if I have a friend that I think is really, truly overweight, right. I, most of the time, I can't remember not saying something to them about, you're hurting yourself. And I try to do it in a nice way. And I figured that if a person doesn't want to pay attention to me, that's their choice. Right. But I feel that since I do care about them, I want to try and do what I can. Right. And even in the case of two or three of my nieces, no matter what I said, they're still big as a barn. 
but they're solid barns, and I, I couldn't argue with that, but it's still, it's something that we have a mindset in our country that uh, we, need, we, need, we need to eat better. I, I've traveled throughout the Orient, and um, I never saw too many fat people or obese people. Is that, is that because of the diet, or is it because of the way they've been raised? It could be a combination of a lot of different things. Um, I mean, it could be a combination of the dietary um, habits, but also activity level has a lot to do with it as, as well as too. I think uh, here in the uh, United States, uh, we don't uh, move as much. Uh, we rely on uh, your vehicle to get to point A to point B. Uh, in a lot of the uh, European cities and in Asian cities, uh, a lot of requiring uh, walking is required. Walking and use of public transportation yeah. is, is required. So I think activity has a lot to do with this. Certainly dietary uh, habit has a lot to do with this as well, too. Who should really be screened for heart disease, Dr. Zhang? Uh, as I mentioned before, people who have any kind of cardiac symptoms, such as chest pain or shortness of breath, uh, if, especially with physical activity, uh, when you're walking in the neighborhood and you start having discomfort, that goes away with rest, and you really need to be screened. But if you have multiple coronary artery disease risk factors, as I mentioned before, uh, then you really should consider screening as well, too. If you're planning on getting involved in a vigorous physical ex activities or exercises, and you have more than two coronary ar artery disease risk factor, you really should consider getting screened as well, too. And the screening doesn't have to involve uh, a whole lot. Uh, it could be as simple as sitting down with your doctor and talking about your symptoms, talking about your risk factors, and come up with a game plan. Um, uh, oftentimes, uh, you can undergo a simple testing, such as uh, exercise stress test, where you walk on a treadmill while being monitored to see whether there is an increased risk of uh, you having a cardiac event. Uh, but again, the first thing to do at this point is that if you think that you have enough of those coronary artery disease risk factors, um, then you really sh need to talk to your doctor uh, regarding uh, your risk factors and need for screening. I feel the medicine has advanced a long way in the last mm -hmm. 20 years. What are some of the better known treatment options for people that have heart disease or they have a problem can it be fixed? I know we re you hear people having a four valve, five valve uh, uh, transplant and all this stuff, the mechanical hearts and using all this stuff. I know what was done to me. There's a big piece of mesh up mm -hmm. in here, and I, but I'm, my heart is is very good. It's in very good shape. Mm -hmm. In terms of the cardiac uh, intervention, I mean, uh, there are so many different type of interventional procedure that is available today that wasn't available 30, 40 years ago. Uh, in terms of coronary work, uh, again, uh, cholesterol buildup is what causes coronary artery disease. Uh, buildup of atherosclerotic cholesterol plaque in the blood vessel that causes or interferes with the flow of blood to the, your heart muscles. In those situations, what we can do is to actually identify the blockages, put a small, tiny wire um, across the blockages, and then over the wire deliver a catheter that has a balloon mounted at the end. The balloon is positioned exactly where the lesion is located, and we can inflate the balloon uh, to push the plaque uh, uh, up against the wall. We also use stents, uh, coronary stents or wire mesh, uh, that is designed to push the plaque up against the wall and keep it there, and stent function as a scaffold. Um, and we have those uh, things available for coronary artery disease. But other parts of heart disease spectrum, uh, such as rhythm problems, can be treated uh, with um, procedure where they can actually identify the short circuit that's causing the rhythm problem and burn it uh, so that they can cure you of your rhythm problems. We have uh, defibrillators. We can actually identify toxic rhythm that otherwise would kill you, uh, can shock you out of a, a toxic rhythm or into a regular, nice, uh, normal rhythm. We have, is that what you put across here? And that's exactly shot? right. Yes. Okay, yeah. It's, it's we actually, have one of those in our church. Yeah. No, those are actually implanted in your underneath the skin surface. And uh, basically for people who need it, uh, it monitors your heart rhythm around the clock. And if you go into a toxic, dangerous rhythm, the device is there to give you the shock, to reset the heart. Oh, uh, you're talking about a combination um, 
pacemaker defibrillator? Exactly. Right. Okay. That's exactly right. But that's much larger than my little old pacemaker. That's, uh, that's a little bit larger than the, your, not your pacemaker. We also have procedure where if you have a hole in the heart, you can actually go inside and actually seal up the hole using a, uh, a device, a disc that is deployed inside the heart. So the traditional way of fixing a hole in the heart would be to try to, to cut your chest open, expose the heart, cut the heart, and suture the hole close. Now it could be done with a small hole in the uh, in your groin, in the blood vessel in the groin, and uh, you know these are procedures that uh, can be done, and you can be discharged the next day from the hospital. I uh, just I think I read about that being in um, something they're using on babies now. Yeah, babies as the uh, baby grow, the heart uh, shape, uh, you know, the hole size does. Uh, uh, grow in size. Uh, so if you do a procedure, it might have to be done over again over the course of time. But yes, that's something that could be done. But, but while we're speaking about babies, folks, I think I need to congratulate Dr. Zhang. He just, his wife just presented him with a boy or a girl, was it? It was two a weeks? girl, two week old girl. Two week old girl. And you're all, you have an, a four year old. Four year old boy. Four year old girl. Boy. Boy. Okay. So <laughs> okay. do you uh, have intentions on a large family? No, I think we're pretty much uh, done here. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, well, let me check my questions here. Um, the last question I had here, what are the most important factors in managing heart disease? The most important factor is to identify your symptoms as something that is concerning and seeking medical uh, attention. Uh, second most important would be to identify the risk factors that you may have for heart disease and aggressively modifying those. Uh, as I mentioned before, obesity, you can modify that. High blood pressure, you can modify that with the assistance of your, uh, your uh, doctor. Same thing with diabetes and cholesterol. We do have exercise, medicines, uh, things that can actually improve those uh, numbers. If you're a tobacco user, you need to quit smoking. That's very, very important uh, because tobacco has a, a significant impact, not only on coronary disease, but other disease processes such as cancer, such as peripheral arterial disease or stroke as well too. So um, those two things are probably the most important uh, things. Um, have a close relationship with your doctor, discuss your risk, discuss your symptoms, and if necessary, undergo a screening process. I've done several shows on obesity, and I think that obesity is probably one of our number one uh, risk factors for heart disease, isn't it? That's uh, one of the important okay. risk factors. Broad time, Dr. Zhang. I want to thank you for doing this show. I, I think it's important that people need to know more about uh, about heart disease, vascular disease. It, it's so important, And uh, but thank you for being with us today. Thank and you I want to thank you, me. viewer, for watching today's episode of Focus on Seniors. If you have questions or comments, please call radio station WMEL 1300 AM at 321-631-1300. For more information on senior care and resources, visit our website, helpingseniorsofbrevard.com. And I want to thank you viewers for watching, and I hope that you've learned something about overall mouth care. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Joe. You're quite welcome. <laughs>